Um, the session this afternoon is going to cover um, how to use the technology, what it's all about, um, give you an overview of it and hopefully give you some takeaways. Um, but first of all, if I could just introduce the team who's on the call. So first of all, I've got Councillor Tom Fitzpatrick. Give us a wave, Tom. <laughs> And uh, Alex Cliff from our highways department, who's using the technology on a daily basis. Um, Ali Cubit, who's running our use cases. Give us a wave, uh, Alex and Ali. Um, Michael Price from Unio Tech. Hello. And, and Mark Stanley um, from Thingitude, who's actually going to be running a lot of the session this afternoon and to tell you all about this technology. So, um, in terms of housekeeping, um, we will have plenty of opportunity for you to ask questions both in the chat and throughout the session. We'll you can ask questions. We're going to try and keep it fairly informal. So if you've got a burning question on one of the subjects that we're talking about, um, feel free to to put that in the chat and then we'll pick that up or ask you to ask the question. Um, and there's a hands up function on Teams if you haven't used Teams before. So um, press the hands up function and we will come to you if we can. Um, we will mute most people throughout the session and we will please be aware we'll be recording the session, won't we, Ali? Excellent. So um, what's, what's happening this afternoon? So let me just put the slides back up. So uh, we're going to have a brief introduction from Tom, Councillor Tom Fitzpatrick. Then I'm going to tell you a little bit about the project and then we've got to get straight on with it with Mark Stanley, who's got to talk you through the technology and, and give you a demonstration. And then hopefully at the end, we will get to the point where we can um, have a, an all question and answer session. So hopefully that uh, ticks all the boxes for you and I'll hand you over to Councillor Tom Fitzpatrick. Well, good afternoon, welcome everyone. And I know Kurt always says a brief introduction, so I live up to that hint. Um, I'm Tom Fitzpatrick, Cabinet Member for Innovation Transformation Performance. And um, a lot of that means we're doing internal work, we're focusing on changing attitudes and processes in the council to make jobs better, but also to deliver services efficiently. Um, but also it's not just an inward looking thing for the county council, we're looking outward and doing what we can to help the wider business and um, residents of, of Norfolk. Um, it seems October 2018 we sponsored the IOT conference in Norwich, um, and since then, we've gone on to work with Suffolk and build the Innovation Network, which is the biggest of its type in Britain. So we're very proud of that. Um, obviously, a lot of that work has been done by people like Kurt um, and, and his team in driving that forward. Um, huge amount of work um, when coronavirus hit as well. Um, we were actually very much prepared at Norfolk. We had people able to work from home right from the word go. A lot of that went back to a lot of the contingency planning work that had been done in, in the past um, and the last test we'd done was February of this year. So a lot of work done, but um, a lot of that was recognised by our peers and we're very proud in September and you see that Kurt and I are still very proud, but we were named Digital Council of the Year and um, that's a real tribute to the, the work that's been done by the team and the ability to embrace change. So um, so welcome to everyone, but um, I'm very conscious of that you're not here to hear me, uh, you're here to hear Kurt and Mark Stanley and uh, without further ado I'm going to hand over to Kurt who's going to explain the background and then pass on to Mark for the technology and demonstrations. Kurt over to you, thank you. Thank you very much Tom. So just a bit of background for those who have maybe not joined the launch uh, event or haven't uh, uh, seen this technology before. We're rolling out a network across Norfolk and Suffolk um, called the Norfolk and Suffolk Innovation Network. This is using long range wide area network technology. So a bit like mobile phone technology, but you can't make calls with it. You can't browse the Internet. But what you can do is have sensors that collect data and then send them to the Internet so you can have a dashboard. So as per this diagram, a sensor and Mark will go into more detail about this later, a sensor that um, maybe monitors the temperature or counts people will collect some data 
small packets of data, small sets of information, send it over to the over the radio network to a gateway, and that gateway will send it to a dashboard. Now we're going to have 110 of these gateways in Norfolk. We're so so far we've got 50 out there, and we've pretty much covered all of Norfolk. So we're now going round again and filling in some gaps. Um, but that means you can have sensors on the highway, you can have them in your homes, or you can monitor things with them and then take action and make decisions. And that's why we're doing it. So we can then have businesses use the technology, maybe deliver services differently, maybe develop new services or even start a business like Michael Price from Uniotech, who's on the call today. Um, the things the county council is doing with it, it's always good to share what we're already using it for. So on the left hand side of the slide, I'm not going to go for every one, but as you can see, we had the story about the winter gritting um, and we've been tr tracking staff and public at Gresson Hall, all the way down to, we've got Ben Burgess using it for crop monitoring in, in Norfolk. And these are real live things. They're not things we're intending to do. They're things that are already happening and working and working very successfully. Um, now, if you've got a business and you were thinking, actually, oh, I want to offer this service, you could use this network to do their, to do those sort of things for free. You could deploy sensors, you can develop the dashboards, or you can do the bit in between. In the middle there, there's a load of things we're investigating at the moment. Now, we spend a million pound on social care in Norfolk every single day. So if any, anything we can do to bring down that bill using, the, uh, using this technology um, is obviously a good thing. But the real social benefit from this would be if we can use this technology to help people live independently longer. So we're looking at that in adult social care. Um, and we're also looking at things like flood and air quality and those things. So they're currently under investigation and on the right hand side we've got a load of other ideas that we're working on and we've got to approach Norfolk businesses to help us with some of these ideas, maybe through a hack in the future. But that's all the background I wanted to give. I'm now going to hand you over to Mark Stanley, who's a, who I would say is an expert in this region and he's going to talk us through and bring us up to speed on, on what the technology is and how to use it. So over to you. Mark. Thanks very much, Kurt. Um, right now, this is where we test things out. So hopefully I can share my screen and, and everything will work wonderful. Um, if it, it doesn't, do shout. Uh, so I'm hoping you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Thank you. And if I um, switch to the internet, you can see that as well. That's right. So thank you. Um, in today's session, what I wanted to cover was a quick introduction to the Internet of Things and specifically where LoRaWAN fits into the whole world of IoT um, and what, what it's good for and what it's bad for as well, so that you can avoid uh, spending a lot of time and money on, on something that, that LoRaWAN just doesn't suit. Um, I'm going to talk uh, briefly about the Things Network uh, which is the, uh, the the provider of the the network that we use here in Norfolk, um, and then uh, we'll I'll, there'll be some time then for questions if if anyone has any, um, and then I will go into a technical demonstration where we actually look at how a message from a sensor reaches its de destination, and um, how you register applications and devices on the network, um, and how you into your app application. And um, then I'm going to talk about how to how you might get started. So I've just got a couple of slides with some uh, helpful places to go for information and some kit that you might want to uh, buy yourself. And then, uh, as Kurt said at the beginning, there'll be a question and answer session at the end. Um, I think the idea is that you ask questions uh, on the chat uh, throughout this session, and then Ali will um, will uh, bring them to my attention as we go along. On the Oh. Do a very quick bit about uh, Thingitude. Uh, so we have been involved in the Internet of Things since the end of 2015. So we are just about five years old now. Um, and uh, our business is all about supporting local government and um, central government really um, in in using uh, really turning the potential of the Internet of Things into into something real and measurable. Um, I've been doing some consultancy with Digital Catapult in the past few years as well, where I've been working with quite a few startups, uh, helping them take advantage of the Internet of Things. Um, on top of that, I've been a co-organiser of the Things Conference, 
uh, with Emily from Norwich and uh, I'm ambassador of the Things Network in the UK and uh, speak quite a lot about promoting community-led Internet of Things across the UK. Um, on the right hand side you've got some uh, awards that we've been very lucky to win over the last three years uh, for our, our work in Internet of Things in the Thames Valley which is where I'm based. That's enough about me there. So uh, the Internet of the Things. So I, I think the first question, well, first of all, let, let's all agree on what the Internet of Things is. Um, so this is the uh, the official definition from the the, uh, the excellent Wikipedia. Um, so the Internet of Things, it's a network of physical devices um, and that consists um, of devices that have software, they have sensors or they're, they're actuators and they're connected. Um, and it allows them to connect and exchange data over the internet. Um, each of the devices has to have a unique identity, so you know where the information came from, and they, they need to be able to operate within the existing internet in infrastructure, so we're not building extra stuff. Um, why bother at all? Uh, so the reason, uh, uh, the reason people are excited about the Internet of Things and what it offers to business and to councils and to communities is that you, you can make better decisions uh, with with these systems um, so you can get real-time information that wasn't previously available um, and that allows you to predict when things are going to go wrong and that means that then you can improve the service that you offer customers and an example I like to use is on lift mains um, it's not very not very glamorous but but it is a real problem and um, if you speak to lift engineers they often say when they have to go out and repair a lift in a block of flats because it's broken that the residents there noticed that it was making a funny noise for weeks but because they're human they didn't like to make a fuss and so they didn't bother calling the engineers to say about the funny noise and then of course they're really angry when the lift breaks and the engineer has to come out and it, it takes a while to fix well, if you had a sensor in there um, it could listen to the funny noise and it wouldn't it wouldn't feel embarrassed it would be happy to log a, a service desk call with the lift company and then the lift company could come out and repair the lift before it actually breaks and that way all the residents were a lot happier and the landlords were a lot, lot happier and and for the lift company their their reputation is better you you can uh monitor stuff 24 hours um every day every every year so um, in hospitals at the moment, nurses um, who we love are having to uh, manually go and check the temperature of fridges and they write the answer in a book and they do that. I think it's four times. So human error is going to creep into that. And, you know, sometimes they might run wrong temperature down, but also they're only doing it six times a day, whereas you could have a, a temperature sensor in the fridge that send an alert if if the temperature went out of spec. And that would be covered all the time. It all also frees up the nurses to do more valuable work. Um, and the third reason, of course, is, is saving money. So that's a, a very important one. Um, and uh, that is often done by, by um, you know, reducing running costs or avoiding manual inspections of things. Um, to give you an example, a real life example, network, um, they talk about um, if if they can take advantage of the Internet of Things, these are the kind of savings that they can make across the across the rail network. And I think we all agree that if they could reduce um, downtime following failures, or if they could reduce the number of failures, uh, then uh, that would you know the the train network work a lot better for everybody. I did say there are four reasons, and this one I think has come to life certainly uh, during lockdown that the need to look out for each other and um, really to try and improve the quality of life for people is, is, is a very strong reason and a, a driver behind a lot of the Internet of Things. Um, so what you're looking at here is uh, a project um, monitoring uh, the well-being of older people uh, so that they can live in their homes independently for longer. Um, and another another project which is about um, making the streets feel safer for women students when they walk home at night. And these things, you know, they they might not be they might not be the biggest things, but if you can if you can make the whole 
or everybody who lives in the town uh, feel better about it, then then it makes that town a more attractive place to live, which obviously means in time it, it, it's better for the for the whole region. Uh, so what does an Internet of Things system look like? Uh, this this device you see in front of you, this is one of the first prototypes I made. Um, believe it or not, it's to track hedge. Um, so the idea is the device, which is about, I suppose, is about four centimetres long. Um, it, it would stick, it obviously wouldn't live on this brown board, but it would stick on the back of a hedgehog and uh, record their whereabouts in Regent's Park. Uh, that's what it was intended for. Um, the Internet of Things uh, needs a lot of component parts. So you have the things themselves um, and then they communicate wirelessly via gateways or base stations. And this is this is the bit where um, Norfolk County Council is is way ahead of the rest of the UK and has, has deployed, uh, I think Kurt said, 50 gateways across Norfolk, uh, which provides immense coverage uh, and, and really make, makes it available to everyone who lives and works in, in, in that region, which is which is a fantastic advantage over a lot of the country. Um, so the sensors can uh, send messages to the gateway and the gateway then passes it forward into the internet and then your applications live at the other end. So um, if we take the Lyft company example, which is the uh, bottom one here, um, when a Lyft is making a funny noise, that broadcasts a message from the Lyft sensor, it reaches a gateway, one or two gateways, and that message is passed on to the, the network server and forwarded through to a maintenance application, uh, uh, um, um, a lift engineer would be dispatched. We're going to go through um, the different parts of this uh, during this talk. So um, next up, I will do the same. Um, I'm just going to um, let you read this a minute, and then I'm going to bring my screen back because I, I thought it might be nice to show you some sensors because there's there's quite a variety. Um, so sensors are here um, to measure or detect something uh, whereas actuators actually do something so um, if you're I suppose if you if you imagine um, a greenhouse uh, you can have a sensor that is measuring the temperature and if the temperature is too warm then you would have an actuator that would open up a window and and therefore bring the temperature down and um, all sensors and actuators need a power source, they need a unique identity so we know where they are, and they need a method of communication. Um, let me stop sharing. Brief. Mark, can I interject right. there? Yeah. Because we've had a question from Alex Barrett. Um, Alex says, how good is the coverage of Norfolk? What other security issues are hosting in Laura Hub? So I think you're going to talk about security later, aren't you? I will um, be. But it might be, have you, uh, um, I think Alex de Cuba has just put um, the TTM mapper into the channel text. But if I can quickly just show that, just so we can answer Alex Barrett's question. So sure. uh, hopefully we can do that. Uh, so hopefully you can see my screen now. So I've gone to ttmmapper.org. Any any of you in the audience who wants to go there, just open your browser, go to ttmmapper.org, and then you can move around. And you, what you'll be able to see if you look at Norfolk is is a view like this, and it's got blue clouds and numbers. So the clouds and where the numbers are, are where our gateways are. And on this particular view, if you see these purple lines, that's where sensors have been connecting to the gateways that are in in Norfolk. So have a look at that. You can zoom in and out. So if I zoom in, as you can see, that shows you more detail. Uh, as you can see, we've got pretty good coverage all over Norfolk. So I just thought I'd show you that. So that's ttmmapper.org and, and it's in the chat. Brilliant. OK, okay right. Um, I thought, yes, I would show you some sensors. So um, just to give you an idea of the sort of size and shape and, and variety, um, this one I'm holding it up now in front of the camera. This is a a, a door or window uh, sensor. So it has uh, two parts to it. One bit goes on the door, one bit goes on the frame. And if the door opens or closes, um, it sends a message. Um, so it's a, a useful thing um, for like a remote storage site. 
um, something like that where you wanted to know if when somebody goes in and out of the place. Um, this one was actually used uh, in a COVID mask store at the beginning of lockdown when uh, people were 3D printing masks. Um, they we had a storage facility around here and the, the people wanted to know a couple of things. They wanted to know who was going in there because they need to make sure that it's a sterile conditions and they needed to monitor the environment as well. So we had that one on the door and then we had this this uh, monitoring the uh, environmental conditions of the room it was in. The, the real value in that was the audit trail it built up over time to demonstrate that that the, all the um, masks were being stored in a, in a safe condition. Um, this is a slightly more, <laughs> less safe um, device, uh, quite a famous one in the Internet of Things world. It, it's an internet connected mousetrap um, and uh, that will actually uh, send messages uh, to an application to say when a mouse has been caught or when a mouse has nicked the bug and got away with it. Um, what else have I got? I've got at the at the other end of animal size, uh, this thing uh, with big weight on the end. This goes around the, the neck of a, of a cow um, and it tracks cows out in fields uh, or on, on hilltops. Uh, so uh, really to try and avoid or detect cattle rustling, uh, which is still still quite a big problem in parts of the UK. So those are those are some sensors. Um, here's a gateway. Uh, so this this is a gateway. One example of a gateway. Um, this is the antenna, and this typically uh, would live on a pole on a rooftop uh, somewhere. Um, so there will be uh, gateways like this, fifty odd gateways like this on rooftops around North. Right. I'll go back to. Uh, Back to my slides. Right, we've got a couple of questions just come in as well while sure. we're doing that. Should we just take those ones? So yeah, just going yeah. just going back to Alex Barrett's question as well. He he had a second part to that, which was around the what are the security issues of hosting um, a LoRaWAN hub or a LoRaWAN gateway? Um, I don't know if you want to pick up that one first. Um, if I can do that, if I can do that in a little while. Oh, sorry. Yeah, um, okay. I will definitely address it during the talk, um, but I'd, I'd like to get to that later. Um, if, yep. if that's okay. Okay. Yeah, OK, there's there was a couple of other ones which sort of come in with the sensors that are there at the moment. Um, yeah. Stuart had a question. Are there footfall and vehicle accounting applications for town centres? Um, I can easily answer that one. Yes, yes, there are available already off the shelf. And um, we can definitely put you in touch with some suppliers that provide them. And the second question from Ashley there was, are sensors available off the shelf or do you need to know electronics to build them? So, Mark, I don't know if you want to just uh, make a point on that one. Yeah, there are um, these days there are loads of sensors available off the shelf um, and uh, I'd be happy to um, put you in touch with some suppliers um, if you if you're interested. There's quite a few around now, which is great. Didn't used to be that, that way and um, we did used to have to build um, build quite a few sensors and um, still we still do to a certain extent. Oh, I don't think you can see me at the moment, but I've got I'll show you I'll show them in a bit. Um, I've got some that I've I've made myself, and I'm sure actually Michael at Uniotech um, would be able to talk about that, that more later, because um, I know he's he's been developing sensors. Does that answer that question? I think so. Thanks. Yeah, we can post some more information if needed later. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for okay. the questions. Great. That's all right. Right. Uh, okay. So we've talked about sensors and actuators. Um, this is my awful di diagram of how it how it actually works. Um, so what you're seeing here is my my sort of Farmville type farm uh, where we have an irrigation system. Uh, so the irrigation valve you see uh, here in blue, that is an actuator because it turns the water on and off. And then we have a, a soil condition sensor that is looking at moisture and temperature of the soil, um, or, or maybe it's looking looking at um, the chemical composition of the soil. Um, that is a sensor. A weather station obviously is a sensor. So the sensors send, they transmit messages out. Um, they're received at a gateway somewhere nearby. 
and then that gateway forwards it onto the the uh, the cloud, and then um, that can end up up on an application for a use, or in this case, um, more likely the uh, soil condition will be dry. The weather will say it's going to be dry all day. Application in the cloud makes a decision to turn on the irrigation valve and uh, and water the field. Um, if if the weather showed that there was impending uh, rain coming, then you wouldn't do that. So that that's a kind of uh, easy to understand diagram of how the Internet of Things will work. Um, but there are many di different types of communication network that that could be used. Um, Wi-Fi, I suppose, is an obvious one and around the home um, that makes a lot of sense. Um, but you also have mobile phone network, you have Bluetooth, um, and then you have a collection of uh, technologies called low power wide area networks. And LoRaWAN fits into that category. Um, what this diagram is meant to show is that there's some factors that would help you make the right decision about which network technology to use. Um, the ones that we're going to concentrate on today are power, data, and the range of the network. Um, but the other others are all important factors too. Uh, the this diagram, um, the the idea is at the left hand side going upwards is the amount of data that you're trying to send. So if you're only trying to send a tiny amount of data over a very short distance, say for example, um, you are a, a um, like a credit card almost. Um, you know, you, you tap tap them on the uh, on the machines to make your payments now. And um, that uses technology called NFC, um, which is near field communication. So you can send a tiny amount of data over a very short distance. Um, and uh, Oyster cards use use the same sort of same sort of technology. And um, you also can find that in warehouses where they, they, they use it to track goods going in and out of, uh, of the warehouse doors. And so it, that's good for tiny amounts of data over a very short distance. If you want to send more data, then you would be looking at something like Bluetooth. So if you think um, like your Bluetooth headphones, obviously they can take quite a lot of data because sound is quite a lot of data, but not over a tremendous distance. It's really, you know, from your, the phone in your back pocket to your to your head or a few meters. It, it really doesn't doesn't travel very far. Um, and then you've got uh, Wi-Fi. Um, now Wi-Fi, you can send enormous amounts of data, so you can stream Netflix. Um, but you might you can do that in the spare bedroom. You might be able to do it at one end of the garden, but probably not down the far end of the garden. So again, the range of it is is not very far. So if you want to stream Netflix and and you want to be out and about, then um, you're going to need longer range technology. And this is where the, the 4G and at some point the, the 5G technology is going to uh, revolutionize that. LoRaWAN and, and all the LP1 technologies are, are down the, the other end really, where uh, it's tiny amounts of data, um, but over a very long distance. So whereas um, the Wi-Fi box you've got at home can maybe go 30 meters, maybe 50 meters radius. One of these gateways, which does the same job, uh, can go several kilometers. Um, in open space, it can be up to up to 10 kilometers away. Um, so it, it suits a, a, a different type of use case. Um, the the other big factor in this is, is the battery life. So so um, with Bluetooth or with Wi-Fi or with um, mobile phones, uh, the batteries don't last that long. Um, you can imagine a, a sensor like, like a parking sensor. Somebody somebody asked a question about. Um, so you can have a, a, a parking sensor embedded on. There's no way you would you would use a mobile phone network for that because you'd be digging it up every night to to recharge the battery. So um, LoRaWAN really lends itself to that because the battery can last a year. Um, and uh, the, the sensors that I've shown you today um, are a testament to that. The uh, environment sensor, the battery in there, typically lasts about 18 months uh, to two years. 
Uh, so it lends itself to those sort of use cases. Um, so this, this is really just re-emphasizing that um, if you if you are looking uh, a lot of data, um, then uh, but not a lot of distance, you'd be looking at Wi-Fi. If you're looking at a lot of data but a lot of distance, then you're really talking about 4G. And if you're looking about not very much data but loads of distance, then so rural areas in particular, uh, laurel and suits, but it also works very well in built-up areas. Um, so the key features of it, you've got long battery life, um, cost of ownership is relatively low, um, you're not paying um, Vodafone or EE um, every time you send a message um, because uh, the, the, there is no cost of transmitting the, the messages from the sensors. Uh, they're very easy to deploy um, because they're batch, um, there's a lot of wiring that you don't need. So, so if you um, if you are monitoring the environmental condition in a, a room, you don't need to wire anything in. You just need to stick and, and literally stick one of these sensors onto the wall and the job is done. So it makes it makes doing things like building management um, very much more cost effective than, than previously has been the case. Uh, you can reach remote areas really well, which is great for farms, which often don't get mobile. Phones. Um, you know, they may they may well be out of range of, of a LoRaWAN network, but the farmer is able to install their own LoRaWAN uh, gateway. And suddenly coverage coverage is there and you can't do that with mobile phone technology. It's also uh, suitable for uh, things like smart meters because uh, the, the radio signal can penetrate walls, get, get inside buildings. Um, it, it lends itself to that sort of use case as well. So um, Thames Water, where I am, is doing a trial at the moment with smart meters using LoRaWAN uh, to send the data back. So it's not good for everything. Um, some very bad uses for it. Uh, things you can't do, as Kurt said, you can't send emails, you can't stream Netflix. Um, you can't send large amounts of data. Uh, typically, uh, a message will be less than 50 bytes. And, uh, and if you can, you want to make that as small as, as possible because then you preserve the life of the battery. So, um, but 50, 50 bytes is about the limit for, for reliably send. Um, it's not, not suitable for um, continuous transmission of data either. Uh, the, the, um, the network uses uh, a license exempt bit of the, the radio spectrum, uh, which fortunately is going to remain that way even after the Brexit. So there's no, no change there. Um, but it's, it's free to use a piece of the radio spectrum, but there is rules that come with it. And one of those rules is that there's a 1% duty cycle, which means that any one sensor can only take up 1% of the available air. Uh, so what you your, what that translates to roughly is uh, you can only send a message every couple of minutes. Um, and really, if you want to make good use of, of the network and be a good, Good citizen, you would be looking at use cases where you're you're sending less frequently than that. Um, it is radio, and radio is prone to interference and uh, affected by the weather. So there are some truly life or death scenarios where it wouldn't be the right technology to use. Um, and it isn't the fastest uh, technology in the world. So you shouldn't expect a truly instantaneous response. So what I mean by this is um, if you imagine you drive up to a, a car park barrier and when your wheels, the, the sort of bit that's embedded in the road, the barrier lifts up. If instead you were, it, you were driving over a sensor and that sensor had to send a message to the internet and then the application would send a message back to the barrier to open up. That could take maybe 30 seconds, which would be, be very annoying. So you, it's fine for many, many cases, but there are some situations where a true, where truly instantaneous response is needed and LoRaWAN wouldn't make sense. But there's lots of good use cases. Um, 
And so avoiding the cost of manual inspections is, is a really big area. Uh, things like monitoring Legionella in buildings. Uh, in in the, the local government world, there's a, a lot of interest in uh, being able to predict when rubbish bins need emptying and uh, organising smart smart routes to, to empty bins. Um, really any anything that that needs regular in spam is is a good area to look at if you were looking at opportunities where where the internet of things might be useful and um, preventative maintenance as i said earlier with the lift example and um, the lift maintenance that that's a really uh, strong use um for, for the internet of things excuse me and very often you you'll find a, a very good business case for for doing something there uh, security monitoring, um, whether this is looking for, for leaks in a boiler room or whether um, checking whether a door remains locked in a storage facility, um, they're, they're all good uses. Um, also monitoring, uh, just monitoring people movement. Um, tracking assets, whether that's a cow on a field or, or a, a shipping container uh, is, a, is a good use of LoRaWAN, um, happens quite a lot. And uh, but general measuring of conditions, so things like air quality in towns. Um, Croydon, uh, Croydon was doing an awful lot of construction work and was concerned about the um, the, the the sort of detriment of air quality uh, that the construction work might cause. So they put air air quality uh, sensors up across the city um, to help them help them monitor that and to uh, to help them try and promote good practice to the to the construction firms. Uh, we talked about oh, so one of the questions was, was about counting people. Um, so footfall is, is a good use, use counting vehicles um, and uh, looking for things like potholes um, and uh, monitoring power usage as well. Um, in so um, in in remote areas, say a farm or something like that, you'd want to know if, if power suddenly started being used at unexpected times of the night um, and remote control uh, um, is I think this is an area where there's it, it, there's plenty of room for growth in in terms of uh, the internet of things at the moment a lot of the focus is on measuring stuff and not so much on doing things and I think I think that's going to be an area for growth over the next couple of years uh, so I'll talk quickly about the things network uh, Things Network um, is a it's a global movement. Um, it started uh, five and a bit years ago um, in Amsterdam, uh, uh, summer of 2015, with these two guys. So you've got Johan and Winker, and uh, they learned about LoRaWAN and uh, decided that they knew enough geeks in in Amsterdam that they could probably set up a, a network that would cover the city. And that's what they went out to do. and then um, because they're entrepreneurial um, they developed the things network and um, that is something that has spread uh, across across Europe and across the world and um, oh going in the wrong direction and now it's in so five years on it's in 150 countries there's 16,000 gateways uh, deployed around the world and over 125,000 contributors. It's free to use um, and the community is very helpful and supportive and if it's something that you decide to get involved in I think you'll find it rewarding too. Um, now in Norfolk in particular uh, you've got the, the I think Kurt said it's, it's the biggest uh, local authority network in the UK. Um, I'm a bit jealous uh, because in, in Reading we're building our own our own network but, but we don't we don't have this many deployed gateways yet um, but, but, but we're getting there. Um, but yeah there's uh, 50, 50 gateways across across Norfolk and more to come which means that you've got a head start because there is there is great coverage already available. So um, some good uses for you. Um, in rural areas, uh, remote remote uh, facility and equipment monitoring. So um, keeping an eye on quad bikes in the middle of the night. Um, uh, maintenance work, trying to reduce fly tipping, 
and general security type things are, are good uses. Um, I don't know what everyone's business is um, on, on this call, but there's good examples here of, of a variety of sorts. And uh, if you have um, a particular business and you're wondering whether whether it's um, whether it's viable, uh, let me know. Um, I'm sure we can come up with some good examples. One of the um, one of the very popular ones that people talk about with Internet of Things is, is flood monitoring. So there's a, a group based in Oxford who built some devices. They don't quite look like this, but well, I can't show you. And um, they uh, um, you stick them under bridges and they measure the height of the water. Um, obviously, you can't stop a flood, unfortunately, but what you can do is warn the residents nearby so that they can move their valuables up from the basement and the ground floor upstairs and you can avoid a lot of heart that way. OK, um, I don't know if there are any questions about what what Laura Vine is good for, Ali? No, I don't think we've had any further questions, so I am happy to crack on. OK, um, well, I hope everyone's ready because we're going to get a bit more technical now. Um, so we'll actually start looking at how, how it actually works. So uh, now somebody asked about security. Um, the messages that get sent uh, from the sensors to the application are encrypted uh, end to end. So the um, security of the messages is is controlled uh, from from the sensor right the way through. Um, it's 128 bit uh, AES encryption, uh, which is which is a decent amount of encryption. I don't think it would stop a, a dedicated team of uh, Russian or Chinese hackers to to break into it. But um, for for most people's uses, I think I think it's a, a a strong enough encryption. Um, the uh, what else to say? The, the sensors. I think one of the things we we hear a lot in the news about uh, people hacking into um, uh, video, you know, Wi-Fi connected video cameras and your your um, your doorbells and uh, uh, Wi-Fi connected kettles, all kinds of things. Um, with the sensors and actuators that we're talking about here, they're not connected in the same way to the internet. They don't have an IP address. So somebody get in and, and hack them like that. Um, they would need to physically access that sensor in order to be able to um, to hack into it. They need they need to physically get to it. Um, and even if they did, they're, they're limited with the same sort of 50 bytes uh, that that we're all limited to. So it's its use as a vector for um, for doing damage is very limited as an actuators. Um, the gateways themselves, obviously they are connected to the internet and so there are, are we, we need to make sure that that they are secured. Um, typically your gateway runs some version of Linux. Um, typically when you buy them, they come with a username and password and some of those are standard usernames and passwords, so they do need to be changed to something uh, more secure. And um, if you are connecting those to your, then um, often what businesses will do is actually segment off a bit of the, uh, their own network um, so that it doesn't it doesn't actually really come into to the corporate network as such. It just goes straight out again to the internet. Um, I can talk more about that um, if people, um, you know, the uh, the practice of, of securing gateways is quite quite proven now. Um, obviously, if you use uh, 4G uh, like mobile phone uh, backhaul, then that's pretty secure anyway. So you don't you don't have the same same kind of worries there. Um, all you really need to provide to a gateway in that case is, is just a power supply. Mark just, um, the, just that, yeah. Mark, just at that point, I'm just going to, uh, Alex, does that answer your question? I, um, I know you sort of come back to that security one around the the, the gateway on your own network. Does that answer uh, what you were trying to ask? Did, did you want to ex uh, uh, expand on what you're after a bit more, Alex? If you want to come off mute and maybe talk directly to Mark, you might be able to answer the question. 
Um, can you hear me? Yeah, yep, we can. Yep. Okay. Um, it's really if if I want to put, put a hub on my network, am I um, putting my net my network network at risk? Um, how can I protect my network whilst hosting a hub? Um, it, is this at, at home? Um, in an office. In a, in an office. Um, so there's the the way anyone into your gateway is via the internet that's the only way in they can't they can't get by pretending to be a sensor and hacking into to your gateway and um, they they would have to be on your network and log into log into your gateway so so it doesn't it doesn't add add, add risk in in that way um, okay mm -hmm. i'm not sure if i've explained that well there isn't yeah the ways to, um, if the gateway was on your, um, they would they would either have to be on your network inside, in and and logging into you, the gateway, or they could, I suppose they could, um, well I know because as soon as they as soon as they disconnect your network, that it, it's no longer on the network, is it? Yeah. So, yeah, I I think I think you're you're pretty safe there. I I could uh, I could give you a different angle on that or a slightly different approach. So for Norfolk County Council, what we've done, is obviously we've got a corporate network, a network that covers all 400 sites odd. Um, and, we, uh, and what we've said to Capita who provide that network to us, could you set up a separate VLAN if you know what those are? So basically all of the gateways are on a separate virtual network and, and all to is the gateways and the internet so they can't touch our corporate traffic we just did that as an extra security pr uh, precaution although what mark says is true you know um, you'd have to get to the gateway you'd have to be on the network so you'd have already hacked in if you were going to hack in um, so that makes it quite secure so it's only as secure as the security you've got in the first place protecting your network i think i'll have to go with that and uh, but uh, th thanks thanks for the uh the uh, the uh, diversion. Um, and and yeah, no uh, Alex, did we have another question there? Uh, Not from me. Okay, uh, Ali, was there another question anywhere? I uh, don't think there was any other questions. It was just okay. a statement about a um, gay hubs on a Raspberry Pi that can be used as well on an IP network. Um, so no, it's just, just a statement more than a Thank question, you. I think. So, thanks, thanks, Mark. That's okay. So someone was talking about Raspberry Pis. You can build your own gateway using a Raspberry Pi. Um, there's a hat that you can buy. Um, in fact, uh, there's a company not, not too far from, I think they may even be in Norfolk, Pi Supply, um, who, who supply a, a hat that goes on a Raspberry Pi that will turn your Pi into a LoRaWAN gateway. Um, so you can, you can build your own gateway uh, pretty inexpensively. Um, so, how does the device send data to the network? Uh, so, if you if you um, imagine there's thousands of devices out there, um, so they they broadcast message. any gateways in range, any LoRaWAN gateways will attempt to forward that message onto their network server. But not all gateways use the Things network. There are other LoRaWAN networks available. And, uh, and there are private instances of, of, of LoRaWAN networks. So how do you ensure that the, the message you send only goes to the right network server and doesn't you know, inadvertently go to, go to, go to a competitor or, or someone, someone of concern? So, um, sorry, this is my metaphor. Um, I apologize if it's oversimplistic, but I hope it makes sense. Um, if you think about sending a, a letter and if you don't put a stamp on your letter, Royal Mail doesn't deliver it. Um, it, it just, you know, doesn't even get on the, the network. And uh, there is a, a key in the, the sensor uh, called a network session key, um, which gives that sensor permission to send messages on, on the um, You need to obviously be able to say where you're sending it to. Um, so that's the equivalent of the the address that you're sending it to, and that's the application session key. Um, 
and the uh, the third bit of information is is the, the address of the sensor itself so the unique identifier of the sensor so with those three bits of information then um, you can you can send a message correctly through uh, if if any of those bits are wrong then your message won't get through so um, here's a wonderful bit of animation hopefully um, so our lift company is sending a letter or sending a message um, it, it goes through a, um, and it reaches the things the things network then authenticates the um, network session key and device address um, that that message has been so the the message itself whether the lift is noisy or not is wrapped um, in effectively an envelope which has these these keys in it um, if they're there it can it can carry on and um, the things network knows where to send the message um, and that message is then decrypted do you remember I said that all messages are encrypted from the beginning? So they're decrypted at the other end uh, using the application session key. Now, in, in time, maybe Lyft code decides it needs its own private network. Um, that being the, uh, they those two network servers will have different network keys which means that the, the message that was sent previously would be rejected by one network server and only accepted by the other. What that means is that some of these routes, so you can see I've greyed out these routes, uh, are no longer available. So the lift sensor cannot send a message to the community gateway anymore. Um, and the similarly, the parking application cannot send a message to the lift company anymore um, because because they will no longer be, be accepted. Um, and that that way you're protecting and, and making sure that the de devices are only sending data through to the right places where they're expand. Um, now that also presents a problem because um, Laura One networks, unlike uh, the mobile phone network, are not ubiquitous across the country. Um, and there is a there is growing recognition that it would be good to be able to share data between networks because sometimes you would intentionally want to um, want to piggyback on someone else's gateway to send a message through to someone else. Um, and so the next version of the Things Network, um, which is it is out now, um, and it's being being rolled out across uh, across the community. I think next um, includes something called a packet broker and that allows a controlled amount of um, of the right messages to be forwarded on if you like so which reopens then reopens these lines of communication that, that have been cut out so I think that's that's going to be an exciting um, addition to uh, to the way LoRaWAN works because it will allow networks across across the country then to sort of mesh together better than they better than they currently do. Whereas the Things Network community network is is great because uh, sensors that are used in Reading uh, work perfectly well in Norfolk as as they would in um, that's only if it's talking to gateways connected to the Things Network community um, version. So this this allows people to have private networks and still take advantage of the community network and vice versa for their what that means is that in Norfolk, a uh, Lyft company could still be providing a service to the uh, parking application um, if it, it decided to, to help out uh, the parking company. Okay, there's two ways to activate a device. Um, one is called, um, um, by device, I mean one of these sensors. Uh, one is called activation by personalization, um, where you literally put those three keys uh, you program them into the device um, that that's easy to do um, but it isn't practical for mass production because it means you've got to put a unique set of keys into every single device so if if you were doing I don't know um, even if you're doing a hundred parking spaces that could become tiresome um, but if you were doing a thousand homes that would become really quite unbearable 
Um, so the more preferred way is using something called over the air activation. Um, and in this case, you configure a different, different set of keys into the device. And the idea is that um, what happens then is when you turn the device on, it registers with the things network and it negotiates with it um, to, to get the network session key, the application session key, and the device address, um, the three things that it needs to send a message. And I'll, I'll demonstrate this um, rather than rather than just talk about it here, because it, it isn't as complex as it sounds. Um, so we'll, what I'll do now is um, switch, switch over uh, shortly, and uh, and actually showing you how to connect to the things network and to see data coming out in an application. If if anyone wants to um, uh, sort of go along with this, uh, what I'm doing is uh, you would need a user account on the things network, which is free. Um, so you would just uh, go to that, that link and create yourself a user account. And then I'm, for the purposes of this demonstration, I'm using a, a free to use dashboard uh, called Everything, um, which, uh, well, you'll see, hopefully you'll see why I use it because it, it works by magic. And uh, the, the other thing I'm doing is using a sensor um, called an Epsis sensor um, uh, to configure that. Uh, you do it through an app on your phone. Um, so I will, I will show or well, you will see me doing that. Um, but uh, really you would need the Things Network account and an Everything account if you wanted to copy what I'm doing here. Um, when you go to the Things Network console, um, it's split into uh, gateways that you own or manage and applications that, that you own or manage. Um, and then in each application you have got uh, sensors registered to that application. Um, so I will show you that now. Right. So we are, are in we are in the things network. Um, actually, I mean, um, just to show you, I've got two tabs up on my uh, two tabs up on my screen. Uh, so I've got the things network console here. And then I have um, this is the this is the Smart Berkshire um, console, which is a private instance of a, of a Things Network. It looks exactly the same, works exactly the same. Uh, so anything that you do here is is something that you can uh, you can easily translate across. So um, we're going to add a new application. Um, we have to give it a name. So um, let's give it a name like NCC. Five. The uh, new one. What could go demo for Norfolk County Council, um, and then we click add, and that has given me an application EU, um, which uh, if we can, is the first of the three things I need for an over the air activation. Um, right, and you, you can see it was created 23 seconds ago. And um, so the next thing to do is, is to register a device to it. So I'm going to click here to register a device and we will call this, the, let's call it NCC environment I1. Mark, just to let you know, um, we can't. We can only see your PowerPoint at the moment, not the console. Oh, can you? Oh, that's not meant to happen. Can you see my console now? I can see PowerPoint, but not presenting. Oh, right. What am I doing wrong? You've got two monitors and this on the other monitor, maybe. No, I'm not that not that advanced. Um, hold on. Right, let's see. Can you see the console now? Yeah, that's the console now. Yeah. 
Brilliant. Okay, so um, right then, what I would do is just delete. Um, and can you zoom just, in a bit? Yeah. Thank you. Doesn't like me deleting things, but um, we'll delete it so that we can start again. Right, uh, zoom in. Right, let's see how this goes. So I'm going to add add an application. Um, you need to give it an um, so NCC November 25. Uh, some sort of description. That was brave. Um, demo for NCC and then when I click create it will generate this application EUI which is the ah um, so I've got the <laughs> right there we go oh. okay let's just right there we go so now I've got an application EU, and um, that key we'll need to put into the device. That's one of the three keys that we need. So next up, I've got no devices registered at the moment, so I'm going to register a device. Um, and I'm going to call it NCC. You can call these um, whatever you want. This is a sort of, it needs to be unique, but, um, but only unique within this application. And then, um, then you need to enter the device EUI. Now, um, on the back of the sensor that I've got, my uh, CUI, um, which I will, I will type um, and hopefully make no mistakes. So that's um, that's the device EUI for this environment sensor that I've got in my hand. Um, it would generate an app key when I press create or register. There we go. I've got three sets of keys now, which hopefully you can see. And I'm just stop sharing my screen so that you, you can see me um, because I need to get those keys into here and to do that I need to use my phone so um, because this sensor comes with an application on your phone to configure it so um, sorry. <laughs> there we go you might have heard it bleep and it um it says update the data set um doesn't i mean you have to trust me on this so it, it's not something i can share and um, what i can do in fact what i did do um, yeah, let me share my, my screen again Um, so I know this isn't in presentation mode at the moment, but hopefully you can see on the right hand side here, um, you can see the LSIS application. This is what's on my phone at the moment. Um, so what I need to do is um, type in the right keys, uh, which is a bit fit, um, but I'm used to it. So uh, here we go. So um, it, it already knows the device EUI because because it, it comes with that. Uh, so I need to add the app UI. Uh, um, so this isn't the most exciting bit of the demo. Um, well, 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 we're doing it in real time, aren't we? So people will know what to expect if real. they do it. Yeah. Um, and now I've got to type in the app key, which is uh, torturous. Um, but uh, there isn't. 
some some devices uh, come with uh, different ways of uh, of doing this, but I think uh, this one works rather well. So, um, but you can can see that if you were um, if you were so motivated, you could you could definitely come up with a a registration system um, if you were a, an application developer that dramatically improve what people are doing all over the world at the moment to uh, register their devices. Right, hopefully I have typed in that 30 um, I have to write it back to the device. And it is written back. Um, and now, um, now the device itself will, uh, and then it will try and join the network. So what we're we're looking at um, is the status never seen to suddenly change. And um, oh, I think that went smoother than it did in practice. And uh, you can see now I've got a device address, I've got a network session key, and I've got an application session key. And the device was last seen 10 seconds ago. So um, this, uh, uh, well, you can see what I clicked on, on sorry, I clicked on data um, on the on the console, which allows me to see the data that actually gets sent um, from the device. And uh, hopefully I remembered to change the device to send every 60 seconds rather than every 10 minutes. But you can see that the the payload isn't making a whole amount of sense here. Um, not to us humans. So um, what we need to do is um, edit the data, uh, uh, sorry, create a, a payload decoder um, that will turn this message into something that, that we can use as, as human beings. So um, to do that, uh, the Things Network Console has a place where you can insert a decoder payload function. Um, it gives you some, some example code here. Um, now, in this case, we're not going to use this. Um, because ELSIS provides its own code. Which luckily we don't have to type in. So we can just copy that and then paste that into here. And save that. And then if we go Back to the just data. a tip at that point, um, Mark. Um, I realised when I yeah. was doing this for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, once you follow the instructions, it's fairly straightforward. But I forgot to press save when you did the payload change. Ah. So the bit you just done about just save that. It's easy to miss that yeah. step. So I just it, thought I'd highlight that for people. Yes, it, it is. What you can see now, though, is that um, rather than just have these rather obscure numbers. Is it's translated it into something meaning see that um, it's quite room um, and um, the, the VDD is the amount of battery power used, um, humidity, obviously light levels um, and motion. So um, this particular sensor is able to count uh, people movement, although I think I've got that turned off at the moment. Um, so suddenly we've got data that's actually you know useful and and meaningful at a, at a human level rather than that just hexadecimal code um and you can see now i've got it sending every man which um just so we're all clear that that's a practice um it should be sending you know really maybe once every 20 minutes or so um but for for, for demonstration purposes it's a lot a lot more convenient if i can uh, if i can send it every minute um right so there so we have been through configuring the else's device we've added the payload format 
Um, the next thing we're going to do is um, create uh, an entry in, in the everything dashboard so that we can start um, start actually seeing the data in, in, a, in, a, in an even more meaningful way. And this is this everything rep application bit of our of our setup. So we've got a sensor and um, it's transmitting messages. Sorry, that's my cat has just come in and trashed stuff. <laughs> Um, we've got a sensor, it's transmitting messages uh, to a gateway. Um, so we've got the Things Network here in Reading, it's transmitting them to a gateway. That gateway has forwarded it onto the Things Network. We've seen the data appearing on the internet. Now what we're going to do is add it to, to an application. Everything is, is the application I'm using. Um, um, as with all these things, they have their own, their own sort of language, if you like, about what you need. Um, we need to create a project and on everything, and then within the project, we create an application. Um, and that's what we integrate into the thing. Network. And I'll show you how that's done. So um, let's give it. Let's just call it. Let's call it an author. And uh, give it a name. Correct project. Um, and, and then uh, we need to create an application. So add a new application. I uh, don't think there's anything I need to do there. Just create that. OK, so that's created an application. Now to integrate it to the Things Network, we need to add um, a trusted API here on, on everything. So I, I just copy that to my clipboard for now. Um, if we go back to the things network, so we've seen um, we've seen our application. We've seen that there is a device attached to it. We added this uh, decoder to work with the payload format. And we've seen the data coming through. Um, integrations is the the next bit, and this is how you how you get data out of the things network and into your application. So we're going to add add integration, and you'll see there is um, there is a range of things that are really, uh, different applications that exist. Here's everything. Now, if you're writing your own application, then it probably makes sense to use either HTTP integration. Um, for those who are technical, um, it will post data to an endpoint that you give it, um, and then you can you can send the data out of there, um, or um, or you can use MQTT, which is a another message queuing system uh, that's that's quite popular. Um, so that that would be how you would uh, how you would integrate things with um, with your own application. Um, if uh, uh, if if you are a user of this amazing product called If uh, If This Then That, uh, then there is integration with that and a whole range of different or oh, TTN mapper, which is what um, Kurt showed you earlier, showing the range. Uh, that's that's on there. There's a whole whole range, um, but we're using everything, and um, we will say uh, now we're in the EU uh, as far as this is concerned. Um, and then we need to paste in the trusted API key, uh, which is what I had copied from everyone. And as Kurt rightly pointed out, save, save your work. That sets it up and running. So what we've done now, if I... Where do I go for If we go back to one of these diagrams, 
So we've seen the sensor, which is the uh, uh, the environment sensor. You haven't seen it, way, but it's in my app. It's going to, uh, so messages are going from that uh, to the gateway, to the things network, and now we've connected up an app on this side, and that application is everything um, here. Uh, now, one of the things um, that I've learned is that this takes a few minutes uh, for stuff to come through. Um, so now would be a good point if there were any questions while, while we're while we're waiting for for the integration to actually take hold. Thanks, Martha. We haven't got any questions that are waiting. Has anybody got anything that they would like to ask right now? I'd, I'd probably comment that um, that you may be using everything with an e missing. But I noticed. <laughs> I kept thinking they spelt wrong. Yeah, and, um, and an i. Yeah, but um, that's just one option. There, there are many options out there that you can use to present your data or, or make decisions with it. Yeah. I think I think there's many free options out there as well, aren't there, Mark? Uh, there, there are, there are. I mean, this I, I use this one because it is um, because it is free. I can uh, let's see if I can show you. Um, wasn't planning on this, but um, what? Uh, this is because I wasn't planning on this. Because <laughs> <laughs> personally, I've set up sensors that then do the connection to things network and then used if then this that as you described. Yeah. yeah. And then pulled that data into Adafruit dashboards because that's an easy way of just chucking something together to prototype it. Um, right. And that seemed to work quite well. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. Um, this is a this is an app um, in Reading uh, which shows uh, people movement on on various streets. Uh, so I can. Oh, see so the Mark's now there. he's monitoring people. <laughs> it, it's yeah, it's been quite it's been quite amazing. It was it's, um, it's part of the student safety thing, and and the idea is that you can show you can show students. Some women like, like to walk home on empty streets sort of look on the edge and, and get home as quickly as they can and some women want to walk home on busy streets absolutely no women want to walk home on a street where there's one person one other person on it um and and so uh, we've got we've got sensors covering a hundred streets around reading um and and the idea is that it will help them plot a route home that that works for them and we, we we've got other sensors on there as well but um, obviously, lockdown has happened, which has uh, rather curtailed uh, the uh, the social life of all our students. Um, but what we have built up uh, over the over this year is an amazing data set of how people movement has changed um, on, in the town. And you can see when lockdown, you know, happened, everybody just opened up. You can you can see over time um, the the change in people flow. Um, Great. We've got a couple of questions there now, Mark, that AM yeah. people have been prompting. So, um, Vicky, can you link a device to more than one IoT account? Yes. That's good. Nice, easy, straightforward answer. Yeah. Yeah, you can. There's um, the um, there's no no reason why you can't have it going to. Um, oh, sorry. Let me let me answer that properly. What you can do in the um, is you can in settings is you can add a collaborator. So at the moment it's it, um, but I could I could add if if any of you know your usernames I could add you now and you would you would see the data coming through on the on this device. So yeah, you can add other collaborators to uh, to your that answers the question. Great. Yeah, there's a couple and, more. Uh, and the, the other bit you can do um, is you can you can have the data go to several applications as well. So it doesn't just need to go to one dashboard. It can go it can go to to several. OK, great. 
Thanks, Vicky. Uh, um, so Andrew's got a question. The device EUI, if your device doesn't have one, uh, for example, I don't think my STM32 boards have one, will TTN create one for me? Uh, your device will need to have one. Um, okay. um, uh, so on, um, on the, um, so what device? 32 board oh, yeah. right no, i don't have one of those to hand but uh on the um there is a let me let me um i'm trying to think how best to answer this when you when you program that board you can you can program in a device eui um and let me see if i go where's my device I go to the settings of the device. What, what I can do is I change that device EUI. So you you decide what that device EUI is, and you can you can program that into your STM board. Um, if if you don't have one at all, so um, let's go here. If I've got a device, I'm registering a device. Um, Um, you can click that and it will automatically generate one for you. Do you, do you see? Can you see my screen? Oh, we, Is that... we've, we've just got your face at the moment if you were oh. trying to show something, Mark. Oh. Oh. Right, hold on. <laughs> let, me, uh, let me come. So I think what you're saying is you can, you can make, make one up and assign it if you needed to. Is that a... Uh... Uh, yeah, so I've, I've done it here so i'm creating a, a second device and um if i don't know the device eui or there isn't one i can just click this box and it will automatically generate so when i when i register this device then the things network has given me a device eui and then i just need to program that into the stm32 then um which i'm i'm assuming and um, the person asking the question is, is comfortable with with doing that. Yeah, thanks. That's, that's great. There was a couple more questions before we uh, crack on as well. So, yeah. um, Philip, um, Philip, you've got a question. Did you want to ask Mark that directly yourself? If you come off mute. Oh, hello. Yeah, Hi. I was just um, wondering how long the data stays within um, the network for. So, say I wanted to read temperatures from this time last year is yeah. that saved on the application somewhere in the cloud or does it have to be saved physically and um, to us to a server or a disk that that's a really good question philip um the things network um is positioning itself as a, really as a conduit for your data and not as a storage point for it that said uh there is um in the in the integration um, you can add an integration here called data storage uh, where the, the things network will um, provide a certain amount of storage but i've a feeling like 90 days worth of storage um, before your data gets erased so no you you would need in your application you would need to be um, listening uh, for messages coming from the things network and then storing them in your database so everything everything does that for us so you can see um you can see now that the charts are starting to come through so you can see how the light is slowly getting darker um i expect the temperature is probably slowly rising um, no temperature is not too bad either um so you can you can see it's storing these data points over time um I don't know how long everything stores them for. I, as I say, I, I really just use this to demonstrate an application working. But in my applications, and I'm, I imagine Uniotech is the same, they when they they actually listen out to receive messages from the things network and then store it in a in a database. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you. Brilliant. Okay. 
Thanks. And we just had one more question. I think Ashley was just asking, uh, do I need my own gateway for sensors or will the sensors find the NCC ones automatically if they're in range? Yeah, so if your device has been added to the things network, um, like like our device, um, then any gateway that is connected to the things network that's in range will pick up will pick up your signals and forward them onto the things network. So you don't need to buy your own. That said, um, if you really want to understand more about how the things network works and, and you're quite geeky, then uh, buying your own is, is not an expensive thing to do, or indeed building your own is not an expensive thing to do. And it does, does give you a bit of extra insight into the whole, the whole setup. Um, but there is no, no need to do that, particularly in Norfolk where your coverage is so good. Brilliant, thanks. I think that's it for questions now. I think we've got half an hour of this session left, Mark, so I'll let you uh, continue. Great, okay. So, um, yeah, really ju just to say, the, um, we didn't, if you remember on, on the project, we, we created a project, we added an application, and then um, the integration, so the spotting the device and adding these charts uh, for temperature and for the battery level and for um, humidity and light levels that all happened automatically and that's you know that, that's one of the nice things about many of the applications that already exist out here for dashboards um, if I go back now to um, uh, to the presentation um, how's that gonna work right are we back on presentation Back on your presentation now, Mark. Right. Right. So we've done the integration, you've seen, seen the data. So I guess, yeah, this is really um, the, the last bits now around getting involved and how to get started. Um, so you will need, um, if you want to get involved uh, with the Norfolk Network, you will need to sign up and create an account at the thingsnetwork.org. Um, it's completely free to do so. Um, and on there, um, we'll find uh, loads of information, loads of tutorials, um, there's a forum, there's a Slack channel, there's there's all kinds of ways to get, get community help. Um, if you are interested in um, the sensor side of things um, and and you don't mind, uh, you don't mind uh, connecting a few wires up, then I think this is a great way to get started. Um, there's a device called a, a Things Uno. In fact, um, here's one. There we go. Right, there is a device called a Things Uno, which looks like this. Um, so it's an Arduino type device. Um, the silver box here, that's the radio unit. Um, on the device. So that's the LoRaWAN bit of radio. Otherwise, it's a, a normal Arduino. Um, that little ceramic thing there is the antenna. Um, so I think I think that is a really good starting point because it's a microcontroller and the radio built in together. That bit costs, I think it's £43. And then um, one of these Grove sensor kits um, has got, it's got about a dozen dozen bits of different types of sensors and actuators in it and um, every it, here's, a, here's a slightly more dangly version but everything just plugs together um, so you don't, don't need to um, solder or anything like that um, you, you just you just plug plug different sensors in um, and uh, and then you can start experimenting with sensors and sending data to the things network. Um, as I say, that is all um, that that's what I would suggest for, for starting. Now uh, if, if you do want to buy yourself a gateway, this is the cheapest one available, um, which is uh, the things indoor gateway um, at £78. Uh, so um, this would be this would be some good stuff to put on your Christmas list. Um, 
if if you're interested in building your own gateway because you've got a Raspberry Pi and and you you really fancy getting your hands dirty, then there's some great tutorials on the Things Network um, how to do that. Um, I can I can send anyone links to that if if they if they can't find it. Um, now obviously um, I would love to work with you, and I'm sure Unio Tech would love to work with you as well. But there is an enormous amount of free help and support out there. Um, so as I say, the Things Network website and forum is probably the uh, the central place to go and familiarise yourself with everything. And uh, you can join or start a local Things Network community. Um, so in in Norfolk, um, if you talk to to Michael uh, from Union Tech, I think it's based in Norfolk at a, in Norwich rather at a hack space. Um, there's another group out near Lowestoft, and then uh, Suffolk has has two uh, two communities as well. But there's no reason why you couldn't um, join one of those or, or start your own, and uh, that gives you that gives you a presence on the Things Network uh, website uh, where you can you can actually start telling people what you're doing and, and engage with with the whole. Okay, I. I think that's about it from me. So I'm happy to take any questions. I'm really open the floor to everyone else to join in as well. Thank you, Mark. That's a very difficult thing trying to do a live demo over a virtual conference with this sort of technology. So uh, well done, you. <laughs> you managed I hope to do it. Worked, okay. <laughs> Yeah, so so we're open the floor to questions. We're, if, if I ask the, Nor the Norfolk team just to make sure the cameras are on so you can see who you're talking to. Um, but I've got one burning question I'm, I'm dying to ask. How did you get the sensors to stick to the hedgehogs? Um, the the real answer is Araldite. Araldite? Um, yeah, it's not it's not it's not as <laughs> nice as it sounds. They um they trim the spines on the back of the hedgehog to make a, a kind of flat surface and then he araldite the sensor to it and then uh, over a couple of weeks uh, the the spines just naturally drop out and get replaced and the sen oh. the sensor falls off but you um there was there was real concern about the weight of the of the device um, mm. i think it had to be uh, 25 grams or less uh, to avoid actually stressing the animals themselves Right. Yeah, that's that's quite interesting. So they monitor the hedgehogs with those sensors. Is that still live now? Uh, it's not. Unfortunately, the, the project never did go live because HS2 came along and um, the bit of Regent's Park we were going to be trialling this in got turned into a car park for giant diggers. Oh, um, right. And oh, so no. the, hedgehogs, the hedgehogs moved, moved on. But the, uh, the the devices it now lives on on an internet connected tricycle uh, that provides tourist information for Reading. <laughs> but that's <laughs> an important point. You've you've developed a sensor to do one thing that collects data, and then you've repurposed it, which I think is one of the things that um, that we found. You know, we've developed GPS sensors for one thing, which was to track vehicles, and now we're yeah. using them in a museum in Norfolk. Oh, well, so. Yeah. Now I'm wondering if anybody in the audience got any particular questions because we've got Michael Price from Unitech on who obviously runs a business around this. Mark obviously does the same. We've got Alex Cliff from Highway so who's using it live for, for Norfolk stuff. So if you've got any questions for those guys, that uh, now's the time to, to ask them. Oh, it's quite quiet. So hopefully we've answered everybody's questions today. Um, oh, here we go. Shameless plug. We have a few things who news at Norwich Hackspace for member use. Oh, that's very good. Um, yeah. So if, if people want to join Norwich Hackspace, they can they can uh, go along and then use some things who knows there. That's that's very good. Thanks for ch shouting that out. That's really helpful. Obviously, if people want to experiment with this technology to look at look at stuff they could develop with it they can build a prototype and then see if it's actually viable as a business because the reason we got the funding from the local enterprise partnership was to encourage innovation and business growth in Norfolk also to help with digital skills in the region but uh, it's really important that if people want to to play with the technology we support them and help them um, so we'll give it another minute or so so if there's any any questions come up in the chat
It doesn't look as though we are. So hopefully we've answered all the questions. Ali, um, you've recorded record the event. Um, have you got to send a link to the video to everybody who joined today? Once you come off oh, mute. Yeah, 20 <laughs> pin, 20 pin apart. Um, yeah, what, once I've uh, uh, just uh, topped and tailed it, I'll, I'll get it published onto one of our channels somewhere and I'll send all of the attendees a link to it. OK, so feel free to pass that on to anybody else who you think may be interested in the event who couldn't attend. Um, so that leads me to thank you all for for coming along and, and finding out about the technology around the Norfolk and Suffolk Innovation Network. Thank you for the people from Norfolk who joined to support the event. Um, a special thanks to, to Mark Stanley for doing the live demo. It's always a challenge and we didn't get to see your cat that came in. <laughs> Um, and thanks for Councillor Tom Fitzpatrick for, for supporting us as always. Are you going to get the cat? <laughs> oh, excellent. <laughs> you need a sensor on your cat, I think, so you know he's coming creeping up behind you. It, I don't actually, because he turns out he's going to three other houses in our street now and we've got a WhatsApp group instead. So I keep getting photos of him in someone else's kitchen. <laughs> my, cat, <laughs> my cat just goes to everybody's for dinner and then comes home and then cries he hasn't had his dinner. So, you know, <laughs> right. Well, thank you all. I'm very pleased uh, the way the session went. Um, hopefully we've answered all your questions. If you do have questions after the event, please feel free to contact myself or Ellie or anybody else uh, from the Norfolk team and then we'll try and answer them for you. Thank you very much and have a good evening. Thanks. Thank you.